the glaciologists boarded the ship in Iceland. Dr. Gordon Hamilton and Lee Stearns from the University of Maine loaded their scientific equipment onto the Greenpeace vessel Arctic Sunrise and the ship could start its journey towards Greenland. There were indications showing that the world's largest island was suffering badly from climate change. But as the ship left the coast of Iceland, no one knew how urgent the situation really was. Within a month, the expedition would reveal that some of the enormous glaciers of Greenland had started their meltdown, with future impacts all around the globe. viewer, Greenland is a vast frozen land. The continent is covered by a huge ice sheet which holds 10% of the world's ice. Spectacular icebergs, barren landscape, long winters and snowstorms are the norm. This land, isolated far up in the north, seems to be locked in a never-changing state of deep freeze. But for the Greenlander, their country is not the same anymore. In the last decade, things have changed. Itakotormit is the most northern village on the east coast of Greenland. It lies at the mouth of the world's largest fjord system, Scoresby Sound. The village has survived the harsh conditions up here thanks to the sea ice and the animals living on it. Generations of hunters have used their dog sleds to hunt adult seals, which they've brought back to the village for food and clothing. Today, around 540 people live in Itakotormit, and everyone we meet is telling us the same story. The sea ice is disappearing with devastating impacts on villagers' way of life. Just north of Itokotormit is the world's largest national park. It covers the entire northeast portion of Greenland. The national park protects animals like polar bears and musk oxen from human interference. But unfortunately, the boundaries of the park cannot protect against climate change caused by the release of greenhouse gas pollution from smokestacks and cars thousands of kilometers away. The polar bear uses the sea ice as a platform to hunt seals for travel and to raise its young. As the ice melts, the animal's habitat and feeding ground disappear threatening the entire population with extinction. Despite the harsh conditions, the high Arctic is home to many plant and animal species. In the rest of the world, many species can survive climate change by migrating to colder latitudes. But this is the end of the road, and the wildlife here have nowhere to go when the temperature rises.
This is the Kangalusuak glacier. When these images were taken, it was just an ordinary glacier. But one week later, the state of Kangalusuak was thrust into headlines all over the world. The glacier had turned into an alarm bell for the melting Arctic. It's all just collapsing, it's all gone sort of like slush puppy. It looks great from 2,000 feet. I said this is what's going to be no problem to work on, but when we got down it was like... Mm. The Arctic sunrise has arrived in the fjord, leading to the Kangalusuak glacier. NASA funded scientist Dr. Gordon Hamilton and PhD student Lee Stearns have studied earlier satellite photos of the glacier and prepared a grid of points to measure the speed of the ice flow. But when they see the glacier from the helicopter, they realize they have to rethink their approach. So this point is where we that's, that's where you have it on the inventory, right. is the face being is right here, between these two. And now two. it's back to that next one. Now it's back there, which is nearly two nautical miles. Wow, that's a lot of retreat. When we flew up on Monday, it was a real surprise to find that uh, the locations of the points we were supposed to land and make the measurements was actually in the fjord. And it was no longer the glacier. And we could see the glacier front, but it was still several kilometers farther up the fjord. Um, so we know that it's uh, retreated um, about five kilometers since the last satellite images that we looked at um, in about three or four years ago. Look at that ice, oh my gosh. It's like it's just been deflated. Well, over here, we oh, measured it this morning from the moraine to the base of the ice. Yeah. It's dropped a thousand feet. Holy smokes. Kangalusuak Glacier is one of the large outlet glaciers in southeast Greenland. It's 7.5 kilometers wide and one kilometer thick. To get a sense of the scale, two Manhattan islands would fit on this glacier. Although it might be difficult to grasp, this vast mass is moving. Every day, this river of ice is transporting frozen water from the ice sheet to the sea. The big question is, at what speed? To determine this, the glaciologists use accurate GPS sensors. Here, close to the glacier's front, the terrain is a chaos of crevasses and seracs formed by the enormous forces generated as the ice moves. The only way to get access to the glacier is by helicopter, and even that's a risky business. Therefore, there are few studies made this close to the glacier's front. Glaciers are like huge conveyor belts that draw ice from the interior of the ice sheet and move it towards the ocean. Once the ice reaches the ocean, it contributes to sea level rise around the globe. As glaciers speed up, they move more and more ice from the ice sheet to the ocean. And once the glaciers have gained speed, it may be impossible to slow them down. There's a possibility that there's a runaway feedback cycle might begin that would start to uh, collapse the ice sheet very rapidly in ways that we don't yet, uh, aren't, don't yet appreciate. Um, and that could uh, remove a large amount of the Greenland ice sheet quite quickly. So that's day one. Back at the ship, the scientists calculate the glacier's speed. The result is shocking. Yeah. So uh, we processed the first set of data and... Uh, it's very complicated it's equations, but... Uh, 13.8 kilometers a year. Oh, that's bad. The result is later calibrated to 14.1 kilometers a year, or 38 meters a day. Kangalusuak has thereby tripled its speed from 1996. That makes it one of the world's fastest moving glaciers. And it turns out it's not the only glacier speeding up. This one we could do if we go. You go in front of me. 
Yeah, well, actually there's a big crevasse between No, no good. It's a crevasse right there, a big one. Helheim Glacier is another large glacier connected to the Greenland ice sheet. Glaciers like Helheim and Kangalusuak are called outlet glaciers because they draw ice directly from the huge Greenland ice sheet, the world's second largest reservoir of fresh water. The terrain is so jagged that it's difficult to conduct the measurements. Greenpeace pilot Hugh Balfour Paul has to use all his skills and concentration to find safe spots to land the helicopter. I'll just set it up right out here. All right. Also here at Helheim, the glaciologists discover that the front has retreated and that the ice is heavily crevassed, clear signs that something is happening. Large amounts of meltwater have formed a system of lakes which indicate that the surface has been melting fast. When the glaciologists have analysed the results, it's clear that a race of the glaciers in southeast Greenland has begun. Helheim Glacier has increased its speed to more than 11 kilometres a year, about 40% faster than the previous measurement in 2001. The Greenpeace videographer on board decides to capture the ice flow on tape. He films Helheim Glacier for eight hours and then compresses it into 10 seconds. In the sequence you're about to see, the movement is obvious. So what's the reason for the racing behaviour of these glaciers? The most likely explanation can be found in the blue lakes of meltwater. One of the concerns is that uh, as the climate warms you get more meltwater production on the surface and that this meltwater can reach the uh, bed of the glacier and actually lubricates the flow of the glacier over the, over the, over the bedrock and it can actually move faster so there, it actually speeds the glacier up and that would have the effect of uh, removing a lot more ice from the interior of the ice sheet in quite a short period of time. The theory is simple. Meltwater is drained through crevasses and vertical tunnels. When it reaches the bedrock, it reduces the friction between the ice and the rock. The glacier speeds up. All the models that have been done before on the future of the Greenland ice sheet need to be recalculated, taking into account that these glaciers are transporting that enormous masses of ice out into the ocean. Dr. Gordon Hamilton and Lee Stearns also measured three glaciers in the Scoresby Sound area, 230 kilometers north of Kangalusuak. They showed no signs of dramatic changes in speed, yet. The fear is that as temperatures increase also further up north, that those still healthy glaciers will also show those reactions and that will have then even more impact on future sea level rise. If a lot of glaciers start, um, outlet glaciers start to speed up and transport more mass through them, then the ice sheet's going to uh, lose mass in the interior and that's going to translate into a, a rise in sea levels. Once the icebergs come off the end of this glacier, that, that's their contribution to, to sea level rise. It's not only Greenlanders who would suffer from the meltdown of the ice sheet. The impact would spread all over the globe, so anyone living in a low-lying country or coastal city would be in the danger zone. Scientists estimate that one-third of the global sea level rise today comes from the Greenland ice sheet. If the entire ice sheet disappeared, the sea would rise by seven metres. But serious problems would occur much sooner than that. Even a sea level rise of about a metre would have uh, drastic effects on most um, coastlines and you don't have to get rid of too much of the ice sheet to, to raise sea levels by, by just a metre. Also, in addition to rise, raising global sea levels, uh, you're going to add a lot of meltwater to the uh, North Atlantic and that's going to change the uh, whole oceanic circulation system. 
So there's lots of ways um, that the Greenland ice sheet interacts with the climate system, but yeah, sea level rise is probably perhaps the most obvious one. Dr. Hamilton and Lee Stearns had finished their studies and were replaced on the Arctic sunrise by another NASA-funded scientist, Dr. Jason Box from Bird Polar Research Center in Ohio. He has gone on expeditions to study the Greenland ice sheet every year for the last 12 years. Dr. Box put together an ice core drilling team from the ship's crew and started to look for information hidden in the annual layers of the ice sheet. We got core. We've drilled down to last summer's melt layer at four meters. All of the snow that's above this thick ice layer is gonna represent the snow accumulation uh, over the last year. So we're gonna have a fairly accurate measurement of how much water has come out of the sky and been deposited on the ice sheet. The ice sheet works pretty much like syrup. As the snow falls at higher elevations, the ice sheet builds up mass. The force of gravity slowly moves this great mass of glacial ice towards the coasts. Since the last ice age, this system has been in balance. The ice that is lost from the glaciers is returned once again to the ice sheet as snowfall in a constant cycle. But the speeding up of the glaciers has disturbed the balance. Okay, 1.57 kilograms. 1.57. Dr. Box's studies and other ice core measurements indicate that there's been an increase in snowfall but not enough to compensate for the enormous amounts of ice being removed through the glaciers. The Greenland ice sheet is losing mass into the ocean at an alarming rate. At least 100 cubic kilometers of water each year, according to Dr. Box's mass balance calculations. That's 100 billion tons, or the weight of half a million oil tankers each year. Some scientists estimate that the actual figure is twice that much. Dr. Box's analyses of the ice cores reveal another interesting fact. The layers from 2003 show there was a lot of rainfall when there should have been snow. This is a clear sign that the temperatures have gone up. A few days later, Dr. Box receives data through the satellite phone email. He's managed to gather 42 years of temperature data from six locations around Greenland. Yeah, when I look around Greenland at all of the stations collectively, there's a similar pattern of warming over the past 20 years in all seasons at all stations, north, south, east, west. In East Greenland, for example, there's been a 6 degrees Celsius warming in the autumn season. What alarms Dr. Box most is the fact that the temperature increase is so consistent around Greenland on both the east and the west coasts. Considering the whole 42-year record, warming is the dominant signal, despite some periods of cooling. Therefore, this warming doesn't seem to be part of a natural cycle, but a clear sign of climate change. sunrise has rounded the south tip of Greenland and reached the west coast. This is the most populated area in Greenland. For the local inhabitants, Dr. Box's results only confirm what they already know. The climate has warmed dramatically and the effects can be found everywhere. We meet four generations of women gathered in Nuuk. Six-year-old Laura soon begins her first day at school. This is an important event in a girl's life, and great-grandmother Charlotte 
has arrived to finish Laura's traditional outfit. <laughs> Greenlandic women wear colourful traditional costumes like this one for important occasions. Traditional boots, kamiks, are handmade out of thin processed seal skin. <laughs> Niels Gundel from Ilulisat takes us out in his boat. He fishes in the summer and in the winter he hunts seals from his dog sled. But the thin sea ice has made dog sled travel dangerous. <laughs> Throughout history, the Inuit have been good at adapting to changes. Lack of animals and hard winters have forced the hunters and their families to move around to find food. But today, the society is different. To cut costs, the authorities have closed down the smallest communities and local people have been relocated to apartment blocks like this one. Here, unemployment and alcoholism are big problems. Many believe that climate change could make these problems even worse and that the entire hunting culture is at stake. Med klimaændringen der vil øh, den befolkningsgruppe øh, flytte til andre øh, steder i, i i hvert fald byerne som øh, klimaflygtninge, hvis man kan sige det på den måde. Og det bliver en befolkningsgruppe som er socialt øh, deklassificeret i de samfund som den kommer til. Og deres kultur vil blive øh, øh, som bygger på fangekulturen, den vil øh, blive et øh, museumsgenstand. This parking lot in Ilulisat shows what happens when the Arctic permafrost releases its grip on the ground. In Semermiyut, just south of Ilulisat, an ancient Inuit dwelling place has started sliding into the sea. Vedret skifter og er meget ustabil. Man kan ikke lige, jeg kan ikke her på stående fod fortælle dig, øh, som i gamle dage, hvordan bliver jeg værd i morgen, fordi det er alt for ustabilt. Det kunne jeg for 20 år siden. I dag der tør jeg ikke at komme med en værprognose. This is by far the most popular tourist attraction in Greenland the Jakobshavn Glacier on Greenland's west coast. People from all over the world come to visit this spectacular landscape of ice and snow. It's famous for being the glacier that holds the world record of producing icebergs. And it's moving faster and faster. 
Between 1992 and 2003, it more than doubled its speed to 12.6 kilometers per year. Melt Lake A. Melt Lake Alpha. Jakobshaven Glacier drained 6.5% of the ice sheet, the largest amount of any single glacier in Greenland. This area is covered by melt lakes and water streams. Melt lakes forming in the summertime are not a new phenomena, but the scientists have noticed that melt lakes are forming at higher elevations than before. Research is just starting to examine the effect this large amount of water will have on the ice sheet and the glaciers that flow from it. The Arctic sunrise has reached De Curvain Harbour north of Ilulisat. It's seven weeks since the ship departed from Iceland. There's one project left before the expedition comes to an end. We can observe melt lakes from space using satellite images, but we, to understand how much water is there, the volume of water, we need to make observations at the surface to really know what we're looking at. That way we can interpret uh, what we see in the satellite images. What we plan to do is take an inflatable boat with the helicopter up to the melt lakes and use echo sounding to measure depth across these lakes. The team decides to start with one of the larger lakes. It's 1.4 kilometers in diameter and there's a river leading from the lake into a deep crack in the ice called a moulin. From there, the water falls straight into the unknown. Somewhere between here and you know 40 kilometers away it's getting to the bed and uh, helping this ice sheet flow faster. You can really hear the, the sound of the water bubbling in this crack. In Ilulisat, Arctic Sunrise crew member and boating expert John Hulsher has borrowed an inflatable small enough to fit into the helicopter. He and Dr. Box have equipped the inflatable with a depth sounder and a GPS. In 20 minutes, they transform the dinghy into a scientific tool ready for launch. Dr. Box and John Hulsher start covering the lake and make a grid of depth data. The deepest part is 18 meters. High above their heads, a NASA satellite captures a new image of the lakes. When Dr. Box later compares the data grid with the satellite image, there's a clear pattern between the color on the image and the depth of the lake. This information will make future studies much easier because scientists will be able to calculate the lake's volume from space using satellite images. The amount of meltwater is one piece in the mastermind puzzle that can give us answers as to how the ice sheet reacts to climate change. The speeding up of the glaciers has added a new sense of urgency in the search for answers. I didn't expect the temperature trends to manifest themselves this clearly in ice sheet acceleration. It, we know that the temperatures have gone up, but to see this rapid response has been a surprise to the science community. At the same time that Dr. Box finished his studies on the melt lakes, environment ministers from all over the world held a climate meeting in Ilulisat. Inspired by the Jakobshaven glacier just around the corner, the ministers struggled to unite. Powerful international agreements and cooperation to reduce greenhouse gases is the only thing that can save us from a melting Greenland. But today, this political process is way too slow to keep up with the racing glaciers. 
In the two months that we've been traveling around Greenland collecting information about the melting ice sheet, the glaciers that are moving faster into the sea, and how this all impacts people's lives, it's become very apparent that Greenland is in crisis and we absolutely have to do something meaningful to stop global warming. For the people living in Greenland, the situation is urgent and they have a clear message for the rest of the world. Although distant and isolated far up in the Arctic, the fate of Greenland concerns all of us. The ice sheet in Greenland influences much of the Northern Hemisphere's weather and locks up 2.7 million cubic kilometers of frozen disaster. What's happening in Greenland is also an early warning. It's there right now, flashing red in front of us. The big question is, what are we going to do about it? <laughs>